Can we terraform the moon? Will our science eventually be superstition? And how do we know if we live in an infinite universe? All this and more in this week's question show. Hey everyone, welcome to another question show your questions, my answers. Now, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. Now we do this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. So if you want to have the live experience, ask questions, follow on questions, you should definitely join the live show. There'll be an event somewhere around here on my channel where you can see we're going to be doing this next time. And then like, click that and then click on the notification button and then also agree to have this posted into your dreams. All right, let's get into the questions. David Litton 112. Is it possible to terraform the moon revive the moon? Yes, it is. We could terraform or revive the moon. I don't know if revive is the right term because the moon has always been terrible. It's never been a place you'd want to live. And so it's not like you can revive a thing that was always super dead. But still, could we make the moon better? And the answer it is theoretically possible to make the moon better. I don't know if we could make the moon better. But in a perfect universe, the moon could be improved. And so the thing that the moon is missing primarily is atmospheric density. It has none. And Earth, we have our the regular atmosphere that you're used to breathing. Now you could take the mix of oxygen and nitrogen, you could deliver it to the moon, you could just release it off the surface of the moon and it would hang out around the surface of the moon. And the reality is, is that the gravity on the moon, although it's very low, it's only like one sixth the gravity of the Earth, it is strong enough to hold on to the, an atmosphere. And so if you just kept feeding the moon more and more of the kind of gas that we have, then it would build up an atmosphere. And after a while, if you released a lot, and you wouldn't need a ton compared to Earth, because the moon is so much smaller than the Earth, you would get to a point where you could have the atmosphere of the moon be the same density as Earth, you could walk around on the moon, and you could breathe. And then if you put a bunch of plants and trees and cyanobacteria and other things, you could have it replenishing the oxygen. And you could have a sustainable atmosphere on the moon. And I'm sure you're wondering, like, this all sounds great. Let's do it. I mean, it's a lot of atmosphere and we can barely take a couple of 100 kilograms of metal and get it from the Earth to the moon. So it's, you know, a future project. But the problem is that the moon doesn't have a magnetosphere, and it's not protected by the Earth's magnetosphere. And so you've got this constant solar wind that is blasting away at it. And without a magnetosphere to protect the atmosphere, that is going to tear the atmosphere away. If the moon had a magnetosphere, it could hold on to the atmosphere, no problem. But because it doesn't, then it is constantly being worn away by the solar wind. You would need to replenish the atmosphere about every 10,000 years or so. And it wouldn't take a lot like a couple of comets brought in from the outer solar system could replenish the moon. And I think there's a lot of advantages to us terraforming the moon before we terraform Mars before we terraform Venus one, it's close, it's easy to get to the moons just right over there, you can get there in a couple of days get back you can communicate almost in real time with people on the moon. And then the other thing is the moon gets about the same amount of sunlight that Earth does. And so with the protection of its atmosphere, you would have more reasonable temperatures. Now that said, a day on the moon is half of a month. And so places on the moon would be in sunlight for two weeks and then in darkness for two weeks. And that is not ideal for plants and trees and things like that. So we would have to evolve plants that could handle that kind of a cycle, maybe. But still the temperatures would be roughly the same as what you would experience on Earth. So I think terraforming the moon is a pretty great idea. If you won't need to terraform something but all terraforming is is brutally difficult. Let me know how it works out for you. I'm sure you've noticed these codes that are showing up on the screen above one of my shoulders. It's this one I know. Um, but that code is a way for you to vote to tell us what you think about the episode that we're doing so far. So if you can, while you're watching this, if there's like your favorite question, go ahead and type the planet name that goes along with that question down in the comments below, and then we will count them all up. And we will celebrate 
the person who asked the best question. And this is kind of surprising. So the one that won for last episode was Yavin. And this was from the Iron Rib asking me about whether or not I'm still blown away by the scale of the universe. And what I find it kind of amazing, I think that was like the last question that I answered in the question show. And yet, everybody voted for that one as their favorite. So um, it's cool that that was the that was the question. My answer, uh, if you haven't checked it, I'll leave a link to the show notes to the previous question show. And you can uh, check out that question. All right, Dave 460. The further you go back in history, the worse our understanding of the world around us was. How long do you think that our current science will still be true? How long until what we consider as science today will be regarded as superstition or mumbo jumbo? I don't think what we consider to be science today will ever be thought of as superstition or mumbo jumbo. There's a really clear dividing line between superstition and science. And We've always had science when the results were readily obvious. Like if you dropped a rock, if if our prehistoric ancestors dropped a rock, they knew that the rock fell, that if you planted a seed, it grew a tree, like there was certain rudimentary science that people are doing the problem solving that we do every day when something isn't working, right? That's science, you have a hypothesis, you carry it out, there's an outcome, if you're not right, you come up with a new hypothesis, you test that one, you see what happens. But when the process wasn't something that people could easily check, that's when superstition snuck in. And so you like, how does the sun work? There's a chariot that carries it across the sky. How does the earth move? It's on the back of a turtle that are on elephants, like, right? Like, like, after a while, you just start making stuff up. And because nobody can check to see if you're wrong, then it just goes by and turns into myth and legend and people just repeat it. But a couple of 100 years ago, we had the scientific revolution, we had this process come in, where you can't say something, unless you can demonstrate with a certain amount of evidence that your theory is correct. And that changed everything. And when you think about say Newton's laws, Newton's laws perfectly describe the motions of objects of spacecraft of objects in orbit, things like that. It's only under extreme situations where Newton's laws fall apart, and where you need to bring in general relativity. And there might be that there are all of these edge cases where our current theories just don't explain what's going on, or there is some larger meta information that describes multiple things we didn't realize were connected, like, oh, we didn't know that in fact, the way the sun works is very connected to the orbit of Pluto, I don't know or that the stars in various galaxies are connected through wormholes, something, right? Who knows what it is, that there is a deeper quantum connection between everything. This is starting to sound like mumbo jumbo again. Anyway, my point is, the theories that we have today will continue on. It's just that the more and more of the edge cases will be explained. I mean, you could imagine like, okay, fine, like it turns out we're all living in a simulation. And then our understanding about the laws of physics are irrelevant, because actually, it's just being done by a programmer. But apart from that, I think 500 years from now, 1000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, people will still use Newton's equations to describe orbits, and they will be perfectly useful for that purpose. It's only when you need to go into a black hole that you will need to take a more complicated set of of formulae out and work with those instead. Rules of Imgur, we can only see far enough into the universe as it is old, and we are said to live in an infinite universe based on our current observations. What could we gather to determine if the universe is infinite or finite? Right? So as we look out into space, the farther we look, the further back in time that we are looking. And when we get to 13.8 billion years ago, which roughly is like 46 billion light years away, because the universe is expanding, these objects are moving away from us, we're moving, we add all that together, the light that left 13.8 billion years ago, that object is now 46 billion light years away from us. But the universe is probably bigger than that. And the reality is that we just don't know the universe could be finite, it wraps on itself or it has some finite 
surrounding to it limiting to its size, or it's infinite it goes on forever in all dimensions. We don't know the difference. And astronomers have tried to figure this out. And the best way to figure out how big the universe is, is to attempt to figure out the shape of the universe to measure the curvature of the universe. And the way they do that is they look back to the cosmic microwave background radiation, where you've got these blobs, which are different temperatures in the universe and these temperatures, and they're just like 10 thousandths of a degree difference. And yet they map to different amounts of density that were in the early universe parts that are higher density and parts that were lower density. And this fundamental question is like, is the universe open? Is it closed? Or is it flat? Each one of those different geometries will mean something different for the universe. And so what astronomers do is they know roughly how big those blobs in the cosmic microwave background should be how far apart those temperature blobs should be. And so then what they do is they measure the characteristics of those blobs. And if the light rays bend towards each other, then the spot looks larger than it actually is. And that means that the universe is closed. If they bend away from each other, then the spot looks smaller than it actually is. And that means that the universe is open. But if the size of those blobs is roughly what you would expect, then the universe is flat. And it doesn't tell you how big the universe is. And in fact, at this point, the most modern careful measurements probably done with the Planck mission was able to measure the these cosmic microwave background radiation blobs to 99.6% precision. And what that means is that the universe is at least 250 times bigger than the 92 billion that we see today. So that is at least 23 trillion light years across. And that is like the bare minimum. So the universe could start to curve above that point. And if those other two measurements that I mentioned, if the universe is actually, you know, if the blobs are a little closer to each other or a little farther than they should be, then we could start to measure some kind of curvature to the to the universe. But right now, to the best of our ability, it's at least 23 trillion light years across. And it could be infinite, we don't know which one it is. Peter Dorr, could there be a moon like object hiding in Earth's L3 Lagrange point? Lagrange point question? Yes. Um, so the Lagrange points are the points of gravitational stability. There are five points L1, 2 and 3 are lined up between the Earth and the sun or between the Earth and the moon. And then the other two L4 and L5 are located ahead and behind 60 degrees in the orbit. So when you look at the Earth and the sun, you've got one point in between the Earth and the sun L1, you've got one point on the other side of the Earth, that's L2. And then you've got one on the other side of the sun L3. And we can't see the L3 point, it is hidden by the sun. Could there be something on the other side of the L3? And the answer is no. And the reason is because L1, 2 and 3 are unstable. So anything you put into the L3 point will just drift away and be visible on the other side of the sun after a few short years, nothing can stay there. And James Webb, which is at the L2 point requires thrusters to remain in the L2 point. As soon as it stops maintaining its position, it will drift out of the L2 point. The L1, 2 and 3 points are empty. There's nothing stable there. It's only the L4 and the L5 points that actually collect debris like the Trojan asteroids around Jupiter. Alex Sender, what would happen if a planet like Jupiter fell directly on the sun? Would it just get submerged in plasma or exploded? And how would it affect the timeline of the star? Planets are eaten by stars on a fairly regular basis across the universe. It happens all the time. It happens when a star reaches the end of its life, and it bloats up as a red giant and it consumes the inner planets 
when the sun dies, it's going to eat Mercury, it's going to eat Venus, it's probably going to eat Earth, but maybe not depends on where the science lies today. And when you think about the orbital mechanics that's actually happening, right? The planet is orbiting around the star, the star is expanding outward. And then the planet after a while starts to dip into the atmosphere of the star. And each time it dips into the outer atmosphere of the star, it receives a bunch of friction, slows down, lowers its orbit, speeds up as it lowers its orbit anyway, and starts to spiral and then it's completely inside the star and then it spirals inward into the star as it's getting torn apart through this journey. And you can imagine situations where you could have a planet that's very close to the star, the star bloats out, and then comes back down again, and the planet is revealed. It's toast, but it's still there. And so it doesn't immediately get destroyed. And so the question you're asking is like, what would happen if a planet like Jupiter fell into the sun? Well, it would be a situation and, and we actually reported on a story kind of like this, just like today as I'm recording this video about an exoplanet that was discovered that is spiraling inward into its star and it's going to die. And so this happens. And as they do as this, as they get closer and closer to the star, what probably happens is that they'll pass the Roche limit around the star. And this is the point where the force of gravity that's pulling on the front of the planet is greater enough on the far side of the planet that essentially the material that holds the planet together can no longer overcome this and it tears the planet into pieces. And then those pieces are torn into pieces and you get a ring. So the, the planet what was once a spherical planet is torn into this stream of material that surrounds the star and then spirals inward and goes into the star. But I think what you're really asking is like, could you just take a planet and just aim it right for the star, just let it go, drop it into the star, what would happen? And it would just go in, it would cause an enormous explosion on the surface of the sun. When you think about say comet striking Jupiter, we get a big explosion. And then it would just be consumed by the star. And then that would be that it would be gone. Astronomers do look for pollution in the upper levels of a star to figure out whether or not they consumed their planets. And you might be amazed to know that within about a billion years of one of these events happening, you can actually detect some of the elements that were once in the planet that are now moving around in the upper levels of the stars atmosphere. So it happens all the time. It's long lasting. The impact of a planet going into a star can be measured for millions if not tens of millions of years after it happens. But it doesn't really affect the star, the star can can take it and just keep going. If you like my answers to your questions, as well as other things that we do at universe today, consider joining our Patreon club, you'll get an ad free experience on universe today.com for life, even if you unsubscribe, you'll get ad free videos, early access to interviews, as well as other perks that are exclusive to our Patreon community. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers, Tom Hickox, David, Giltanan, Philip M. Giardelli, Ken Jones, Dale Victor, Damars, David Huff, Alan Oak, Flip Flan, Sai Rohini Krishna Mandava. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Christopher Stewart. I'm surprised I don't hear astronauts speak verbosely about how amazing the stars in the Milky Way look from space. Does the Milky Way and stars look different from low Earth orbit? So you know, as an amateur astronomer, I have had a chance to talk to a bunch of astronauts about this very topic and ask them almost this exact same question. And a few of them are astronomers I talked to Ron Guerin, who is an amateur astronomer. And before he went up into space, he was really looking forward to seeing the Milky Way seeing the stars from that perch being on, you know, in low Earth orbit and being above the Earth's atmosphere. And what he said was, yeah, when you go into the shadow of the Earth, when you're in darkness, then the stars and the Milky Way are amazing, overpowering, you can definitely pick out the Milky Way, you can definitely pick out uh, the moon, and some other really bright objects. But he said that the rest of the stars are so bright, and there's 
no atmospheric distortion, they don't twinkle, that it was actually really difficult to recognize the constellations in the sky. So even though he was an amateur astronomer, even though he had pointed his telescope at the sky many times, knew his way around, he wasn't able to figure out where he was purely through celestial navigation, which was surprising to him. And was very surprising to me to hear that. So when you're in space, the stars are bright and the difference in brightness between the bright stars and the dimmer stars is not as much as it is here on Earth, like here on Earth, if you live in a big city, maybe you can only see a few of the brightest stars in the sky, that's all you can see. And if you go to really dark skies, you start to get a sense of this, that there's just so many stars. And then when you go to space, it just takes it to the next level. And it's just full of stars, which I guess is why they say it in the 2001. Mike Kinney, assume someone has calculated how long it takes for the Milky Way galaxy to make one trip around the universe. The Milky Way has not made any trips around the universe. Milky Way has um, sort of been in its part of the universe, but there's no like trip, like none, none. This universe is very big and rel relative to the size of the universe, the Milky Way isn't moving very fast. But an interesting question is how often does the Milky Way turn? Or I guess how long does it take for the Earth and the solar system to make one journey around the Milky Way? And it takes about 230 million years to go once around the Milky Way. And so when you think about that, like the entire age of the sun is only about 20 orbits around the Milky Way, which is pretty amazing. Dr. Sloth, why doesn't Mercury fall into the sun? Well, why don't any of the planets fall into the sun? Because they have orbital velocity. The Earth and Mercury and Jupiter, they're all moving at certain speeds. So the Earth, for example, is moving 30 kilometers per second in orbit around the sun. And that speed that orbital velocity, when you think of the outward force that the Earth gets, when it is going around the sun at that speed, perfectly matches the inward force that the sun is pulling on it. If you look at Mercury, it's more like 48 kilometers per second. So Mercury has to move a lot faster because it's a lot closer to the sun and to counteract the the force. Well, if you go all the way out to like Neptune, I think it's like five kilometers per second. So things will slow down the farther you get from the sun, but it's just orbital velocity, everything is in balance even just the earth itself, right? Like why doesn't the earth just pull itself into a black hole? Well, it doesn't because you've got the inward force of gravity pulling the earth in. And then you've got the outward force of the compressed compressibility of all of the rock and dirt and trees on planet earth all piled up. The sun has an inward force, the gravity that's pulling everything inward, and it has an outward force, which is all of the radiation pressure that is coming from the inside of the sun pushing outward to hold the sun in this hydrostatic equilibrium. And so it's a really interesting idea when you look out in space and you think that every single thing that you see out there is in balance, in balance of forces. If you don't have balance, you get acceleration. And so things fall, things crash into other things. That's when you get things get out of balance. But as long as everything is in balance, then planets go nicely around the stars, stars hold their shape, galaxies orbit one another, everything's in balance. And the other thing that I really like to think about is like, think about the forces that were required to get the Earth going 30 kilometers per second, like this gigantic chunk of rock and metal is hurtling through space at 30 kilometers per second. Think about the energies involved to do that. And yet it all started as just a cloud of gas and dust. American loyalist, will we ever visit a Mars lander and rover when astronauts visit the red planet? Yeah, eventually, each one of the objects that humanity has sent to Mars or to the moon, they are historic artifacts, they are future museums in the making. And it's just a matter of us being able to get there and build up enough infrastructure that it makes sense to take some time out of our busy schedule of not dying on the surface of Mars to build a museum that people can go and check it out. But each one of these things, and I don't know what they're like, would you go and find the Viking lander and then bring it back to the Mars colony and set it up so people can be inspired by it? Or would you leave it in place and then wait eventually that humanity has reached the Viking lander and then we build some kind of building around it? I think I would prefer that 
Like I think it would be really cool if you could have a nice building around the, the Mars lander that shows the surface for what it found, and people can go and visit it in some big museum. But but eventually, yeah, and so people always talk about how we're littering, we're putting garbage on the moon and Mars, but there's very little material when you consider the size of these places. And these are all museum exhibits of the future. Think about a Viking longship in place or think about almost any piece of history. It's amazing to go and see it and think about what it took to accomplish that. So yeah, I totally think that in the future, we will get to a point where where we will see each one of these things as just really important historical artifacts that helped us reach these planets. Jose Roberto Miranda, how do you think colonization of Mars would happen if Musk got his starship to work as intended? My position is that Mars sucks. And so there's a lot of people that want to go to Mars, but they just don't realize how badly it sucks. And so I think that the colonization of Mars will be kind of like the colonization of Antarctica, which is a lot of people thought it was a good idea. And then after a while, they rethought it and decided that they didn't want to live in Antarctica, and they won't want to live on Mars. I don't think that we will have a very large habitation on Mars or the moon, while it's really difficult to live on any of those planets. I can't imagine a million people living on a city in Mars in 100 years from now. I can imagine 20 people living on Mars in a research station, kind of like you've got a few hundred people living in Antarctica at McMurdo. But I can't imagine it being a sustainable city. People go to Mars, they'll be really enthusiastic, and then they'll realize that they'll never be able to walk outside and feel the wind. They'll never be able to walk outside and see trees and birds and oceans and rivers. They'll just be inside all the time. And they'll get sick of it and they'll want to come home and eventually it'll just move down to a research station. So that's that's my opinion. And so if Starship works, then it'll help send resupplies to the research station on Mars more quickly. Now, in the long run, when we have enormous amounts of technology, giant fusion plants that allow us to overcome the awfulness of Mars, then maybe we'll have more people living on Mars, but still on its best day, like if you could go and you could terraform Mars, and you could improve the atmosphere and release the oceans, Mars will still suck. It'll still be 10% as good as the Earth. And so Earth is going to be the best place in the entire universe for humanity. And it'll always be the place that we're going to want to go. Kino Keys, how come NASA says space has no ups or down? I'm not sure NASA is the one who's saying people put a lot of emphasis on NASA and think that NASA is somehow like the mouthpiece of all space and astronomy. But NASA is just one space agency on planet Earth. I mean, you've got NASA, which is the American Space Agency, but you've also got the European Space Agency, you've got Roscosmos, you've got the Japanese Space Agency, you've got the Chinese Space Agency, the United Arab Emirates now, the Indian Space Agency, which has sent a spacecraft to the moon, you've got and I'm like missing a bunch, right? There's a Canadian Space Agency, obviously, we put arms on on everything. And all of those space agencies agree, that there is no up or down in space and not just space agents, you've got astronomers, there are 10s of 1000s of professional astronomers who work around the world. And they all agree that there's no such thing as up or down in space. And the reason is because like what you experience as up and down up is over your head, out into space down is below your feet heading down to the center of the earth. But if you're in Australia, compared to me here in Canada, then you are being still pulled with gravity towards the earth. And for you, up is out into the universe, but in this case, above the south, the, in this case, it's above the southern hemisphere of planet Earth, and down is pointing towards the center of the Earth. And that everything in space is relative when you stand, say on the North Pole, of planet Earth, you are seeing a hemisphere of the sky above you, this giant sphere of the universe. 
directly overhead, you've got the North Pole, and you've got all these other constellations around you. And just down at the horizon, you can see the kinds of constellations that would be above the equator if you were standing there. And if you then went to the South Pole of Earth, it would feel exactly the same. And then you would look up and you'd see a completely different set of constellations, you'd see the Southern Cross, you'd see the large and small Magellanic clouds, you would see Alpha Centauri, which is the closest star system to Earth. And just down at the horizon, you would see kind of the same constellations as the person who's standing on the north of the Earth is. Everything is relative in the universe. And everything is based on gravity pulling you inward. And so there's no such thing as up or down. And all space agencies agree. All scientists agree. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone for watching this show. And thanks for everyone who asked a question. Don't forget to vote. Pick the question that you liked the best and we will celebrate it next time. All right, we'll see you next week. If you want to stay on top of all of the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.